everybody sees the recording. And welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad you could join us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cindy Olson. I was former CHRO of Enron and founder of the Executive Strategic Alliance. And we really, really want you guys to ask questions. Uh, you can put them in chat anytime. I'm going to monitor the chat to make sure that uh, they're answered. And if you prefer to come off a uh, uh, mute, feel free to ask the question by raising your hand or just coming off mute. Uh, we always welcome that. And hopefully, hopefully Larry is going to leave time for questions at the end. He's already agreed to a part two because we think that we're going to go over. And so he's he'll talk about that later as we get into as he finishes up the the part one. So I want to talk a little bit about ESA for a second. For the first past seven and a half years, we at ESA have partnered with ADP to build this executive community community of now nearly 3,000 participants in over 20 cities. And we deliver world-class thought leadership and exposure to innovative technologies that are shaping the future of work. The goal is to offer the kinds of thought leadership you would get at a World 50 or a conference board session, and then you don't have to pay for these. So that's the goal is to really deliver that high level world-class thought leadership and ADP sponsors that. So we're unique in that we bring CHROs, CIOs, and other work tech executives together. I don't think a lot of other networks do this, but we do it because we believe that they all must be in lockstep with each other to deliver the kind of worker experience necessary to attract and retain talent, especially now. And in addition to the thought leadership, we also offer our participants the opportunity to be work tech startup advisors, where executives are exposed to next generation startup technologies and exposure to potential startup advisory positions. And finally, we offer a unique board positioning membership that provides all in one place the resources and executive needs to ultimately secure their perfect board seat. So today I am really excited to welcome Larry Bader. I got to see him speak a few months ago and what he's talking about today is so relevant to what's going on in, in everyone's organization today. He joined ADP's strategic team in 2022 to support the company's largest clients. And he brings insights and experiences into the client partnership, partnership to strategize on their unique human capital initiatives and visions. Prior to joining ADP, Larry served as the chief people officer of a very large healthcare organization and led talent management, leadership development, development, performance management, and learning functions for a large international organization. He speaks all over the world with excellent reviews. In fact, he just spoke at the Milwaukee Brewer Stadium this morning, right before this session. Larry currently serves on HRD's advisory board. He is a trained professional coach and the author of Leadership to the Fifth Power, in addition to many certifications in leadership, organization, psychology, and coaching. And joining Larry today is Parker McKenna, who leads human capital and culture strategies for Mosaic Inc., one of the nation's largest all person healthcare organizations, specializing in serving individuals with a variety of long-term service and support needs. And in this role, Parker focus, uh, focuses specifically on strategy development, stakeholder engagement, and creating the best possible experience for Mosaic's workforce across the U.S. P prior to joining Mosaic in 2019, he served in a variety of HR leadership and executive roles in retail, education, and transportation industries in a little-known company, U Union Pacific, specifically. In addition, he has served in multiple roles on the boards of SHRM affiliate chapters and state councils, including HR in Nebraska. As you can see, we've got a couple of, of really, really great speakers today. So with that, Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you. It's all yours. Awesome. Thank you, Cindy. And it is an absolute pleasure uh, being here today and talking with all of you. Uh, Cindy, one housekeeping note. I keep getting a message that there's people in the waiting room. 
I, I'm not sure if, if I should just, I, I'll get rid of that, but I'm just not sure if we're still uh, slowly letting people in or not. So uh, you're on mute. Okay, we're good. All right, well, again, uh, really excited to be here with all of, uh, of you. Um, I was introduced to Cindy when I got here early in my tenure, um, late last year, and have been uh, excited about this opportunity to talk to you all about a topic that I don't think is just near and dear to me. I think it's near and dear to the, all of us. And if it isn't, it should be. So, uh, you know, uh, the other thing I just want to mention is that as Cindy did, you know, note, please, uh, I, I'm comfortable presenting, but I'd rather have a discussion. So if you guys have questions, please just put them in the chat. I know that Cindy and Sean are checking the chat space um, or come off mute and ask the question, stop me. Uh, we are already planning for a part two. It could even be a part three because I'm gonna share with you that what I'm gonna talk to you about today is like the 30,000 foot view, even though it's gonna feel abridged uh, and it is abridged, it, there's a, a tremendous amount of texture beneath all of this that I would love to share with you uh, in the right timing. So uh, we could we, we might stop midway through or we might get through all of it and have part two or three either way. So with that said, let me let me get into the, to the meat of this. So um, we're going to talk about uh, leadership in the world of change and transformation. And we're going to I'm going to start in a couple of minutes to Time to discern the two as well, because I think we use these terms interchangeably and depending on who we are and what role we serve and where we serve it, um, they might not mean the same thing to everyone. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. And then what I'm uh, essentially gonna do is get to the heart of what this conversation is about and it's leadership. And what I wanna do is share with you uh, this concept that it's not good enough to lead the way we've always led because change and transformation are happening at such uh, blistering paces today that if we as leaders don't upgrade our own internal operating systems, we will not continue to be successful the way maybe we have been in the past, nor will we be modeling the behaviors that we need others to demonstrate so that we can scale the organization and they too can be successful and help achieve the results of the organization. Essentially what I've done here is collapsed and integrated three separate frameworks into one model, which I'm referring to as a capability model. And I will make sure that as I work through the three stages, I alert you to which one we're on. <laughs> but uh, one of the frameworks is gonna be focused on change and transformation behaviors. The second capability is going to be targeting leadership behaviors that have been scientifically proven to be important in change and transformation efforts and scaling results. And the third is going to be real deep in the cortex of the leader brain, and that's mindsets. And that's the third capability that we're going to talk about. So on that note, let's get into what change and transformation look like by definition and where they're different. So everyone could probably see our beautiful, uh, I'm a little colorblind, but like purple butterfly on the left. And then we have that wonderful looking cake, calorie filled cake in the center of the screen. These two examples uh, personify true transformation outside of the workplace. And here's why. When a butterfly works through its metamorphosis, it is not a newer and faster caterpillar. It is a butterfly. It's a completely different creature. Once you bake that cake in the middle of the screen, you cannot unbake its ingredients. It's truly transformed. These are absolute examples of transformation outside of the workplace. Within the workplace, I think that we would all agree that most organizations, most leaders are working through a myriad of actual change processes on any given day of the week, any given month of the year. When it comes to transformation, which is different and larger, I would 
probably argue that most organizations are aspiring to transform. It's a, it's a completely different level of absorption. One of the ways that I like to make this distinction pragmatic is when I think about these two uh, workplace definitions of change and transformation, I like to think about it and talk about it this way. Change starts with the present, but it's focused on fixing so that you can have a different future, right? Transformation, conversely, starts with the future in mind. And for that reason, it's focused on creating. So again, change starts with the present and it's focused on fixing, whereas transformation starts with the future in mind and it's focused on the creation process. Now, we all know that leadership is important to both, but it is absolutely essential when we talk about transformation. In that context, leaders literally need to be operating at their highest level of capability and capacity. This is such an important concept that a little over about a year ago, maybe 15 months ago, HBR did uh, wrote an article uh, uh, called uh, Organizational Transformation is an Emotional Journey. They went right to the heart and the head. And they really identified the important role that leaders play in transformation processes. And they talked about this need for them to drive commitment, uh, seeding positivity throughout the workforce, and really creating this idea of safety so that people felt faith in the process. And what they're really talking about there is this idea of long game versus short game, where change might be you know, more instantaneous and achieved within X period of time. Transformation is a longer, more significant, weighty process. So keeping people engaged and helping them maintain faith in the process becomes even more important. The article also talked about the fact that in order for the organization itself to transform, the leaders themselves must work through transforming themselves. Kind of gets back to what I opened up with when I talked about upgrading that internal operating system, that computer that we have in our chip, that chip we have in our, our brains as leaders and, and showing up differently and better over time. And ultimately, the article really talked about this idea of leaders needing to take on new skills, new capabilities, and mindsets. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to I'm gonna pause for a minute, and I I don't need for people to chime in unless they want to. You we know we welcome that, but I think we could argue that or not argue, but agree that over the last few years, we know that our society collectively experienced something that probably for many decades, uh, generations, multi generations at one time didn't experience, and that is the pandemic. And as a result of that, I think it challenged many of us to think about as leaders and even just as human beings, what types of new skills, new capabilities and mindsets did we ourselves have to upgrade or learn or take on so that we could start to transform ourselves and be very present in the current state and prepared for a future state through transformation. So, I'm going to share with you now a, a slide that captures a number of activities, trends, realities, phenomena that took place over the last few years in terms of the workplace landscape. It started not that long ago with this idea of how and where we get work done. I mean, that really was a seismic shift for a period of time in, in every organization uh, in multiple countries. How do we keep moving forward with work as it integrates with our life? And then we had this thing called the Great Resignation. And I don't know about all of you, but I almost felt like this became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I know that we did have this thing called the Great Resignation and there were people who were seriously evaluating um, how they were doing and what they were doing and where they were doing it, and who they were doing it for. But 
I almost so felt and worried that the more we talk about it, the worse it gets. So it, it was somewhat of a reality and maybe also a little bit of a phenomena that was taking place. And then we had these, I call this the quiet trends. Remember this? We first, in one month, I don't remember the exact month that it first came out, but we heard about quiet quitting where people were just detaching and doing less. And then within what seemed like weeks, we started hearing about quiet firing. And I started to myself, well, we just learned about quiet quitting, whether we're already on firing, what is that about? And where managers were kind of giving up on certain people who maybe weren't producing or their favorites, whatever, however you want to define it. And then before you, just when you got your head around that one, we learned about quiet hiring where managers and leaders were figuring out how to get more out of people uh, you know, within their current contribution. Uh, to me, this like rapid firing activity almost happened so quickly. I don't know how could it even been defined as a trend, but it was phenomenon like and it was reality. These things were happening, but they almost took a life on of their own. This is not a trend per se, and it's it's a reality. It's not a phenomenon. People analytics and data is where it's at. Um, it's continuing to just become a, 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 the, the fiber of the organization and how we make decisions around every element uh, around the strategy of an organization. DEI is continuing to evolve. Even now, we're, you know, we're, we're really seeing some fluctuation in organizations' commitment and did they do it the right way? And however you want to talk about it and define it, DEI is here to stay. It's continuing to evolve. And I think organizations are figuring out how to make it work in a meaningful way so that it's sustainable uh, and, and valuable within the context of an organization. Major technology trends, we're not going to get into that today, um, but whether it's AI or ch the chats, uh, we're continuing to just absorb massive amounts of change and uh, yes, transformation as it relates to technology trends. The employee experience is probably ranked up in the top two or three of what most uh, leaders and organizations are thinking about today as how we get work done does continue to change. And then even skills-based development, moving away from the more traditional way we look at jobs and roles, it continues to be uh, in evolution uh, as we talk today. And then I love to talk about this one because I think it's somewhat central to what we're talking about today. And that is this idea of employee health and well-being. Um, you know, uh, when we used to talk about employee health, we we're pretty much always talking about physical health. Now when we talk about health in the workplace. I honestly believe we're talking as much about what's going on between the years and our mental health uh, as we are anything else. And when we talk about well-being. We're even starting to talk about financial well-being today and how that intersects with emotional health and even people's engagement in the workplace, because if I'm worried about how I'm gonna pay my utility bills in three months from now, I'm probably pretty distracted in the workplace. So all of this matters as it starts to collide and, and become reality in the workplace. And then last but not least, we are hearing more and more and continue to hear more and more about this idea of pay equity and pay transparency. So I wanna take a pause for a minute here and I wanna bring Parker into the conversation because he and I met earlier in the week, um, similar backgrounds and just wanted to make sure I was touching base with some other uh, people in, in the alliance, in the, uh, in the group. And I wanted to ask Parker to step in and Parker ask you, how does this, cause I didn't show you this slide before, how does this resonate with you? Would you add five more of your own and what are your thoughts just about your own experience in the workplace landscape over the last few years? Sure. Well, Larry, I was going to tell you, I, I love this slide. I think it's just a great backdrop for a lot of the things that, uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing right now as HR leaders. Um, and I also love how you open this idea that, you know, leading as we always have is not the ticket to, the, to getting us where we want to go. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just sort of add as an underpinning to this that I think in order for us as, as HR leaders to provide really solid guidance to our CEOs and to boards and to our executive teams. We also have to recognize sort of what is the, the root cause of some of this uh, shift and transformation that we're seeing. Um, I think the pandemic is a big part of it. I think it's an accelerator. 
Um, I don't think it's all of it, but I think it's a big part that's accelerated some of the the, the change that um, we've seen. A lot of this um, is not necessarily new uh, in terms of the challenges that we're dealing with, but I think the root cause is either intensified or is maybe slightly shifted as a result of some of the societal issues, some of the economic issues, and some of the issues surrounding the pandemic that we're feeling. Um, so you've got some great examples on the screen here. I think, you know, DEI is a big one right now. This idea of um, what got us to this point is not going to get us to the future. Um, if you think about the focus historically on diversity and looking to see how diverse our organization is, I think we're seeing a shift to a focus on inclusion and uh, ensuring that we have inclusive workplaces where people feel a sense of belonging. And uh, then when we do increase our diversity, that diverse talent feels that they can be successful because they feel a sense of belonging wherever they go, um, as opposed to the, to the other way around. Um, some of the things around ESG and um, you know, social uh, corporations taking stances on social issues and um, so, uh, corporate social responsibility in this space and in others are also, I think, a big, a big part of the evolution um, that we've got to be equipped to you know, educate our CEOs and educate our boards on. When do we speak up? When do we not? Uh, when do we take a position? How do we communicate that position to our workforce so that they continue to feel that sense of belonging um, and they don't feel alienated because they may not exactly agree with what we've said as a, as a corporation? Um, so again, I think those are just some examples along with the ones you have on the screen of things that are, are really relevant today and have been uh, potentially changed or slightly shifted because of some of the dynamics you mentioned. That's great. Parker, there, that's, I, I really appreciate how you kind of dove in behind the thought bubbles and peeled, uh, peeled the onion back a little bit and, and went a little deeper in some of those. That was very helpful. And, and I'll just ask if there's anyone else that wants to either chat any other thoughts in before we continue or come off mute and just add any other thoughts and building on what Parker or I have shared so far uh, as it relates to any of this. All right. Well, if you change your mind, feel a way to, you know, please chat, chat away or come off mute. And we do have a couple of chats. I don't know uh, if, uh, Sean, you wanna just check out those uh, items and see if it's any questions or additions that people have. So. When we talk about all of this activity in such a consolidated period of time, I don't know about you, but it feels like a lot. And that's not all of it, right? So I'm going to introduce to you a term that I have a feeling this group is pretty used to or familiar with, but I don't like to make any assumptions. And we're going to go over it anyway. So uh I would ask you to just think about how many of you, if we're in a room together, physical room, I'd say by show of hands, how many of you have heard the term VUCA? Well, you're gonna, we're gonna talk about it and explore it for a few minutes now. So VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And the acronym, I believe, really describes everything we just talked about and probably a lot more. So VUCA, was a management framework that was originated by a couple uh, academicians uh, back in the late 80s by the name, name of uh, Benis and Nanus. And they introduced the term to describe certain conditions or environments that in fact were volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The framework quickly in the early 1990s worked its way into the military for very obvious reasons. Uh, they uh, really well described the conditions and environments that uh, military operations were finding themselves in. And then uh, uh, the VUCA itself became somewhat of a business lexicon in, in around 2007, 2008, when we had some financial challenges in the country. And then as of late, you're hearing VUCA and VUCA more and more described and explained uh, to really just talk about our current state as a society, which is why when VUCA was first originated, you may have heard the term VUCA environment. And now 
you're hearing the term more often described as a VUCA world because what we've experienced and was accelerated through the pandemic and continues beyond the pandemic is just this very accelerated uh, experience that is very collective in nature. Uh, everyone experienced uh, the results and the byproducts uh, and the pandemic itself and the byproducts of the pandemic. So, and it impacted and you know infiltrated every part of lives, including what we're talking about today, which is the workplace. So while VUCA uh, feels, let me actually, let me go into a little more detail on VUCA itself. I do have another slide that describes the, uh, the acronym in more detail. So when we talk about VUCA, uh, it stands for volatile, which means that the pace of change is very rapid. The U in the acronym stands for uncertainty. And that's where they're talking about the present being very unclear. And for that reason, this is what's important. It's difficult to predict and forecast what's coming around the corner, which can be very unsettling in organizational life where we're often hedging our bets and building strategy around what we think the future is going to be or look like. The C stands for complex, which means there, there are many interconnected parts. And for that reason, there's a likelihood for high levels of confusion. And last but not least, the A stands for ambiguity or ambiguous. And in the VUCA uh, circles, you'll hear people refer to this as a haziness of reality. And for that reason, there's a high potential for the misinterpretation of many things, including what's being communicated or decisions that are being made. So that's VUCA. So I want VUCA for us within the context of this conversation to be uh, kind of like the front door or the backdrop for the capabilities that we're gonna talk about in just a minute. So VUCA is our, our backdrop. So as a, as a backdrop or management framework, when we think about VUCA, it's very helpful because it gives us words and language that explain what we are collectively experiencing. But some people, including myself, might say, well, where do you go from there? It's great to be able to define it and use language, but what do you do with it? Well, I'm not the only one that had that thought. Many other smarter people have before me. And one of those <laughs> is a guy by the name of Bob Johansson. So in 2008, Bob Johansson, who is uh, uh, tagged as a futurist, came up with this idea called VUCA Prime. So remember, I said there's three capabilities that we're going to talk about today. VUCA Prime, leadership behaviors, and mindsets. This is capability number one, VUCA Prime. So Bob Johansson said, well, VUCA is great, but we got to do something about it. How do we pivot around it? How do we navigate the VUCA world? And he came up with another counterbalancing model that he called VUCA Prime. So what we're gonna do is work our way through and just explain at a high level the different features of VUCA Prime. But before we do, just a couple things to think about. A lot of people today are talking about change management and models that are more traditional, whether it's Cotter, uh, McKinsey 7, Kubler, Lewin, you name it. And there's a lot of them they sometimes are not uh, adequate enough to help in application as we work through transformation processes today because things are happening so much more quickly. So when you think about VUCA Prime as a capability to help with transformation in organizations, it's helpful to think about it as an open source engagement approach. And you're going to see more about that in a minute. But what that really means is that top-down approaches to change management don't really work that much anymore. And if they do, they're not working well enough at the pace in which we're operating. Another important, I think, kind of level setting comment around VUCA Prime is that it wasn't intended to get, for any of you Raptors out there, grade five on the East Coast is the highest and grade 10 is the highest on the West Coast. Well, VUCA Prime is not about getting the grade five rapid down to a one or two before we can say, all right, now we can move forward. We know that's just not a reality anymore. VUCA Prime is about building acumen and applying principles that help organizations succeed and scale even in the midst 
of the most rapid waters, the grade four and the grade five. So just keep those two things in mind as we kind of work our way at a high level through VUCA Prime. So before I go any further, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pause and just ask if anyone wants to come off mute and ask a question about VUCA and VUCA Prime before we get into the breakdown of the first capability model, which is VUCA Prime. Is that a question? Is someone just coming off mute? Yeah, I've got a question, and it has to do with transition management. We talk a lot about change, and we talk a lot about transformation, but it seems to me that it, I'm seeing a lot of effective change processes get scuttled by finally managed transition from the old to the new. So where does that fit in your model? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. And I don't know that I'm going to answer it in its entirety now. I think some of it might be answered as we as we break down VUCA prime. And I think that uh, you know, at face value, if I'm understanding the question, it's it's really about leaders at all levels, Rick, absorbing new principles that will allow them to act more quickly and behave differently so that they can lead transformation versus the more traditional change models that are more top down and don't involve as many people where you gain momentum in the process to try to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think some of it's gonna be answered along the way, but tell me if I was way off base in the response. I don't think you were. Yeah, and I'll listen attentively as we go along. Okay, let's see yeah. if we can answer those things. Okay. Hey, Gary? Larry, yes. there's one question that I want to I want to bring in. Deanna Farmer has it in chat, and and when you said something about you know it's not uh, top down man leadership top down, this is really relevant to that. She said perhaps within the employee experience, I might wonder if an additional trend is challenge debate around remote hybrid in in and out of office. Um, and this this really kind of my question around this is. And if it's not a top down, how are these leaders that are mandating people come back to the office? How is that going over? Yeah, I, and I would open that up uh, if you're open to it, to anyone else in the, in the group here who is actually experiencing that and navigating that right now. I can maybe just jump in for a quick second. I, I um, First off, I think the, the whole concept around VUCA as a... Um, you know, just a model for navigating some of this change is great because it's it's business and HR leaders live in this world every day. And I think I, it's really two levels, right? It's often we're faced with a challenge right in front of us, which is a, a VUCA challenge. I'm on a boat in the middle of the ocean and my engines quit. I mean, that I don't know why the, the problem and the solution are uncertain. Situation's volatile. That's right in front of me. I, there's a storm coming and I've got to figure it out. There's that bigger macro issue that often is going to affect the way we address the issue right in front of us. I think the return to work, the hybrid situation is, is an example of that. I think there are all kinds of examples of that. Um, you think about the, uh, thinking back to like uh, George, the, mur the murder of George, George Floyd and other examples. Um, we have to deal with this situation right in front of us, but there are these undercurrents that really affect the overall um, solution. Um, my my thought on the on the remote and, and in office situation, you know, really, um, if you cannot articulate a really clear business justification for um, exclusively requiring employees to be in the office and not offering some sort of hybrid work arrangement, I think you're really going to be uh, limiting your your talent pool, um, and I think you're going to see that on two fronts. One, just you know, from a competitive landscape um, perspective, a lot of employers are offering that um, as a part of the workforce value proposition to their to their workforce. And then secondly, employees are just, I think, generally less likely today than even maybe a few years ago to simply adopt their employer's position on some of these issues. They are interested in more transparency, more insight into the decision-making process, more voice in that decision-making process. And um, 
you know, if you come out with a policy that just says this is the way it's going to be, um, I, I don't I don't think that's a successful strategy um, for for talent attraction and retention moving forward. And I think, by the way, that applies to lots of other other situations too. Um, you know, uh, pick a pick a topic: wage inflation, DEI, all these issues that are are top of mind for a lot of HR and business leaders. If you don't, you know, find a, a way to involve employees and give transparency to that decision making process, uh, I, I think that that's a, a potential opportunity for, uh, you know, dissatisfaction, turnover, those kinds of things. Yeah, great. Anyone else want to add to what Parker shared? And that was Deanna with the question, right, Cindy? Yes. Anyone want to field Deanna's question a different way or add to what Parker added? Quiet group today. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, there's time whenever you want to hop back in. We appreciate the questions, though, and the interaction. So, all right. So that was the kind of the, the, the VUCA prime Bob Johansson, here's how you make VUCA more actionable. And we're going to dig into it a little bit now. And I'm going to share with you uh, this framework where, again, these are more like organizational leadership teaming behaviors as the first, uh, as the first uh, pass at this capability model. And what I did was I just I'm going to share with you the, the breakdown uh, in some sound bites and what that looks like. So what Johansson did was he said, we're going to mitigate volatility with vision. And what he's really talking about within that particular element of the model is he's talking about how leaders need to start using vision maybe differently. Uh, and that could mean more local visioning. It could mean aligning uh, macro vision to local visions, whatever it is. It's asking and requiring that leaders think about how they use vision differently and that within the context of the VUCA world, they use it to help other people, their workforce, see through turbulence. That is the, the, the baseline of what he's talking about in this context. And then he's also talking about using vision and communicating vision in a way that reduces anxiety and distraction in the workplace. Now, while that has always been important, everything we've been talking about for the last roughly 35, 40 minutes is talking about the last few years and how that has taken everything to an entirely new uh, level on the meter uh, around anxiety and as a result, distractions in the workplace. So it's really about how we use vision to help others see through turbulence and mitigate anxiety and distraction. So I add this little kind of coaching tenant um, in this uh, particular context, and you'll sometimes hear this phrase, uh, choose compass over map, as it relates to this particular feature of VUCA Prime. Because rarely is what we're trying to achieve gonna be a linear outcome or process. There's undulations, there's U-turns, there's right turns and left turns, it's about staying focused on direction, uh, not so much being married to the only one or two ways to get there. So that's kind of the one of the extrapolated tenets around vision in this model. The second component of VUCA Prime is understanding. And here, what Johansson is really talking about is how leaders gather information. And it's very easy for leaders at all levels to be very set in their ways about who they go to, to learn from and who they trust. And this model is uh, imploring leaders to think about expanding their networks, going deeper in their existing networks and getting new and fresh perspectives, but also going wider and challenging leaders to go outside of their existing networks so that they can learn from other people and gain fresh perspectives. Another feature of the understanding element is how leaders communicate, not just about vision, but generally speaking. And that means that leaders need to learn and upgrade their own internal systems as we were talking about. And you know whether you hear and use the term lean in, tune in, 
whatever it is, leaders at all levels need to figure out how to listen more empathically. And that means whether, you know, taking the time to really hear what people are saying, listening. Uh, you, you hear sometimes people talk about like leaning in and listening with their full body, but really hearing what people are saying uh, and, and, and being able to uh, respond to that. Uh, you'll sometimes uh, hear that term, you know, we're, we're often listening to respond versus listening to ignite and to understand. That's what this is about. So one of the key coaching tenants that aligns to this particular element of VUCA Prime is this idea of how we learn and the amount of information that we take in today and sometimes hold on to information that we don't need or that isn't working for us. So interestingly enough, this is really, a, for those, many of you may know this, but this is a formal learning process that was made famous uh, by another futurist by the name of Toffler. And uh, he talked about this idea of intentionally um, um, leaving things behind that don't work so that we can make a space for the new things that we need to learn and absorb and reapply. So those are the first two features of VUCA Prime. The uh, third feature of VUCA Prime is clarity. And clarity in this model counters complexity. And here we're talking about critical thinking and decision-making. And Johansson is trying to talk about this idea that in order to help people understand and decrease complexity or limit it, it really comes down to being able to break uh, challenges down into their interconnected parts so that people can truly absorb and understand how decisions are being made. And I would even say how they contribute and innovate around those decisions, which leads to the second feature of clarity. And that is where leaders needing to uh, include more and more people in this uh, skill of critical thinking. You know, it's not enough anymore for just a few leaders or the top leaders of the organization or leadership teams themselves without the rest of the workforce being skilled in critical thinking. We need more and more people in the organization at all levels, even individual contributors to be build acumen in critical thinking so that they can share ideas and innovate along with the rest of the leaders in the organization. Now, as a result, not only will they be better engaged we didn't talk about this yet, but we're talking about building then a, a culture of trust where people know that what they have to say and add means something. Now, in terms of one of the uh, key coaching tenets around clarity, uh, the we talk about simplicity and driving as much simplicity throughout the decision-making process as possible. The fourth component of VUCA Prime, and we're still hovering in our first capability of this three-part model, is agility. And in this model, agility counters ambiguity. And this is a challenging one because we're asking that leaders become more comfortable and maybe even have a little faith in making decisions in times that don't necessarily always allow for past history and the cause effect relationship that maybe we had uh, as a frame of reference before we make a decision. So we may have to say, I don't have all of the possible intelligence that I need to make this decision based on past experience, but I have enough to make the decision that I know we need to make in this condensed period of time. And that's where agility comes into play. So it's this idea of being able to increase our acumen with making assumptions around the best options available. And I'll go back and build on what we talked about earlier. It's not possible to always do that with just a few people or a leadership team. And that's where involving more and more people, as we talked about in the other elements of VUCA Prime, becomes really essential. This is a spider webbing type of model where you can see they all connect and support and rely on each other. And the next component of the agility uh, element is this idea of promoting a culture of experimentation. Again, that's involving people uh, outside of the uh, traditional team or the go-to trusted advisors in an organization. But the slippery slope, I believe, with this particular element is that if we're going to tell people 
We want you to experiment and we want you to become comfortable with this fail fast concept. We have to let people uh, fail and make it safe for them to fail. We can't give them the permission to uh, make decisions, get involved, share their ideas, and even take risk, and then uh, you know hold that, for lack of better terms, against them if it doesn't work out the way we were hoping. So it, it, that's where this whole concept of growth mindset comes into play, even though we're getting ahead of ourselves here. But this idea that we need to make it safe, if we're gonna ask people to take risk and mitigate risk aversion and get people involved, we need, need to make it safe for them to do so. One of the ways we drive agility in an organization is to do this thing that we call change the metronome. It is in fact up to the leaders of an organization to change the cadence of the organization as it relates to setting strategy, execution, and decision-making and any other responsibility of leaders that you can think of in an organization. So that brings us to the conclusion of the first capability within this model, which is VUCA Prime. So Cindy, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation for a minute for a little bit of a housekeeping check because we're at about 12 minutes of the top of the hour. And I'm just gonna be getting into the next capability, which are leadership behaviors. And they're probably gonna go beyond the, uh, the top of the hour. So would you suggest that we stop here, take a couple more questions, do a little recap, and then hold the rest for part two because we're never gonna get the rest into the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Larry. I, I would suggest that you bring Parker, if, if Parker is willing to do this, bring Parker in to comment on the uh, capabilities that you've been talking about in VUCA Prime. Great. And then I've got a question, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna ask that question unless everybody else has asked theirs. But I think you're right. Let's use the last 10 minutes to answer questions, get Parker's a feel on it. Anybody else that wants to come off mute and and weigh in, uh, I know there's several people that said they did they never heard of VUCA. So okay. oh, is is it clear now? And what other questions might they have? Okay, so before we do that, and thank you, and and, and I I think that's the right move. And then uh, Parker will come in and and add some color. Uh, uh, remember, for the next two parts, we're going to really go deeper in this capability model. We're gonna talk about true leadership competencies that have been tied to leadership effectiveness and predicated on the VUCA framework, and then go a layer deeper and talk about mindset, psychological constructs that have been also linked to leadership effectiveness and to business results. So that will be coming up in part two once that's scheduled, but Parker, over to you, and then let's entertain some other questions. Sure. I, I think that, you know, this uh, framework for leadership right now is spot on um, for so many reasons. But, you know, I think good leaders take really complex, challenging problems and complex issues and uh, make them more understandable and break them down so that you can engage more people in the discussion to find an acceptable solution for the organization. I really think that's what it, it boils down to. Um, so I think this is a great framework for doing that. And I also think it takes into account some of the things that we've talked about today, which are those more macro issues that are affecting how uh, some of these issues in front of us show up uh, and how they rear their heads and what they look like and the color and the context and the uh, connectedness to other issues that they take on. So I think it's a great framework. Excellent. All right, Cindy, th Parker, thanks so much for partnering today too and, and you know, doing some color analysis uh, on uh, the play-by-play -play guy. So <laughs> appreciate it. Hey, you had the hard job. I'm happy to take the easy, <laughs> the easy option, just tell you what I think. But I am interested to see if anybody has questions yeah. um, because I think that the conversations where the real value in this kind of thing comes from, so. Anybody have a question? I've got one, I've got one, Larry. So on agility, and this comes from experience where uh, when I was a CHRO, is how do you get people, I think it fits into this agility, how do you get people to feel comfortable that they can dissent? 
And I think it's a leader's job to be up because that kind of falls into the experimentation and being able to fail fast. But the, the whole idea of dissenting, I know that that was an issue that we dealt with all the time. And allowing people to do that in a safe environment seemed to produce better results if they felt like they could, you know, voice their opinions. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start and then please anyone else fill in with your own experience. This is where part two, when we get to the, the competencies that relate to VUCA as a framework and it emanated from VUCA, really start to answer that question. There are behaviors and competencies that lend itself to uh, involvement, innovation, inclusion, uh, 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 tamping risk aversion. Uh, that's what we are absolutely going to talk about. It really comes down, in my opinion, my humble opinion, to the individual and collective leaders upgrading their capabilities around these important behaviors uh, so that they truly, when they ask for dissent or are open to it or are looking for uh, uh, different opinions, mean what they say and that they really want to hear what people say, because if they don't upgrade their own ability and acumen in absorbing that variation or that difference of opinion, they're going to go into what we call a reactive mindset and they're going to fear bite and they're going to they're going to actually diminish the creative competencies that I'm referring to that lead to scaling leaders and the workforce at large. Thanks, Larry. Cindy, hey, can I add one thing, Cindy? Is that OK? Yeah. And so I, I think I, one of the things that's important to your question is I think organizations have to be really clear about what dissension is and what it isn't and what they will do and what they what the organization will do when the dissension is voiced and what they won't do. And I think that creates the space for that to happen. Um, dissension is not arguing. Dissension is articulating an informed, educated position that happens to be contrary to the current voice in the room. Um, dissension is not throwing stones from the shadows. Dissension is being visible and being a part of the solution and just simply articulate, articulating a different point of view. Um, if that happens, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to say we want it and they're going to go behind closed doors and complain about it. We're actually going to be open to receiving it. And so I think part of that is um, articulating that and then also including it in your culture and your expectation with your executive team. Because I've, I've been in organizations, I know we all have, where they say they want an alternate viewpoint. They smile and nod when it's when it's voiced, and then they go in the room and say, "Well, it wasn't that ridiculous that somebody even had the, you know." So you can't have that type of culture uh, because employees will see right through that and know that that's what's actually happening. So, uh, just a couple of thoughts as you as you mentioned that that uh, I wanted to to voice. And I see we've got a hand there too. Yeah. Hey, David. Hey there. Yeah. So I I just wanted to make the comment that I think one of the challenges is that people will want this to end they will want a way through and and they will want sort of resolution to the ambiguity and the complexity and all of those things and i think one of our challenges is i think you you had a slide previously that that said the now normal or or maybe it was supposed to be the new normal but but i think part of our coaching of people is to is to reset the expectation that this isn't something that we're passing through this is something that we're immersed in and it's a condition by which we have to, or in which we have to operate. Amen, and you did read it properly. It is the now normal because I got tired of calling it the new normal because it's here. Yeah. Yeah, good point. And Mindy, you had asked a question about going back to the VUCA slide. I'm not sure which slide, but I forgot to mention, guys, I will send these slides. I think, Larry, are you okay with us sending these slides to everybody that attended? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll chop it up, though, so I could at least send out what we reviewed, and then we could send out the second half so there's context to it. Okay, perfect. Um, any other questions? Uh, Mindy, did you want to say something? I don't hear her. Um, I made a comment in chat that, <clears throat> so this is my first uh, introduction to VUCA, and we then kind of focused on the ambiguous um, or the agility at the end, which was totally fine. And the 
the idea of dissension and experimentation is obviously a good one and having psychological safety to feel like someone can do that. But there clearly are many, many companies that you can't do that. You, you can't have experimentation or dissension because let's say it's a medical facility and, you know, the surgery has to go this way or whatever. So I just, I was just thinking about having access to this and as a leader, you need to, um, you know, decide with if you're the lead leader or if you're just on a team and, and where the potential is to put it into you. So that was, I was just, I was just considering all of that. This is new. So I was just thinking about yeah. times when it can be put to use and then times when it it can, you know, military, hospitals, surgeries. I was just thinking of, you've got to be cognizant about the um, the opportunity to put it into play. So yeah, that was- it's a, that's a great thinking out loud thought. I, I appreciate that. And I think you, you said it, it's all about context, mm-hmm. right? It's no different. You know, they coach someone to get out of a burning building. You're right. going to burn the building, you're going to drag them out, right? right? Uh, so so it's no different than VUCA Prime. How do I find the uh, the, the toll booth or the or the entry points on the parkway to, to uh, weave this in to the fiber of the organization? And that's why it, it, it's going to come down to what we're going to talk about in part two, which it's really starting. I'm showing you an outside-in approach. But what I'm really trying to get to at the end of the day is an inside out approach. You got to start with the abilities and the capabilities and the acumen of the leaders so that they can do this this way. Thank you, though. Great thought. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Larry, we're close to time. Anybody yeah. else have a, well, there's one new message. Let me see what that is. Okay, that's just, just thanks. There, if there, there are people leaving. So yeah. let's do this. We will let everybody, I'll send out a, a follow-up email with the slides and with the recording to everyone. We'll let you know part two when that's going to be. Parker, Parker will be back along with Sue Lamb of Coca-Cola and Julie Cummings of KMPG. And we may have another pan, pan, uh, guest executive. If anybody on wants to be a guest executive, let me know, because I think that's where you get some really good discussions. So thank you to Larry, amazing. Thank you to Parker for being a amazing guest executive and voicing what you guys are doing at Mosaic. We really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody on for taking your time to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye.